Hey Facebook, welcome to Mentored Live, a weekly show where we interview successful entrepreneurs. I'm your host, Mitchell Smedley, and today I'm interviewing Messina Price. Hey Mitch. Hey, hey. Facebook. Messina, thanks for being on the show. This is our first one, and Messina was nice enough to, to be on the show with me today. No problem. Perfect. All zeros. Okay. Great. So, so Messina, what, who are you? What makes you an entrepreneur? Um, well, we have several businesses. I... I would probably say I've been an entrepreneur my whole life, but I don't think I always recognize that. It's easy looking back to see what steps led to where we are now, but as they were going on, of course, I didn't really realize what I was doing or where it was leading me. But we own um, probably the most recognized local business of ours is Nouveau Med Spa and Salon. So my husband is the medical director there. I'm the owner. We work together there with 20 different local employees. Um, and then Price Products is on more of an international level. There's nothing local really about that business. We manufacture and invent innovative feeding items. We have patent holdings there. Um, but most of those sales are to international distributors, toy stores around the country, um, retailers. So, and in Pocatello, we don't have any toy stores or children's shops, so we don't really sell local there. So, um, but that's kind of one of our, that's our main thing. And then um, Price Properties, we own several rental properties in town, mm -hmm. which are right across the street and kind of surround the spa, so it's easy for me. I can see all of them from the front of the spa, so it's easy for me to manage and stay on top of that. And, um, and then MP Dance Company is a nonprofit performing arts theater. And that is not, I guess it's a business, but it's more of a volunteer, my creative outlet and my happy place in the afternoons to kind of let down from the businesses where I work in the mornings. Wow. So. Okay, so you named off, uh, if, forgive, me, forgive me if I mispronounce this, Nuevo? Nuvo. Nuvo. So it means new skin in oh, French, skin. so Nuvo, new skin, if you look okay. at it that way. Okay, we that'll make it easier. We get all the time around here, but it's Nouveau. Yeah. Okay, so Nouveau Med Spa. Yeah. Price Products. Yep. And MP Dance Company, and you had uh, all those rentals. Price Properties. Price Properties. Yep. Wow, you got a lot going on. Yes. Wow. Yeah. So it's all about balance. It's very balanced. We've eliminated businesses that haven't worked, and these four work together very well with the schedule, timing, the employees. Some work at dual businesses and. It, it's very balanced. Wow. Yeah. That's that's pretty cool. How, what, so what was your first business venture? Was it Price Products? No, um, I opened, when I was 17, I worked at Sports World, which was a gym up on Olympus. Okay. And um, I worked in the weight room there in the front desk and we had this daycare that was the size of a closet that was always overflowing. And I had always danced, I was, um, just a trained ballet dancer, and I kind of just saw the opportunity there of I was sitting at the front desk doing laundry and wiping down sweaty gym machines, and I mean, it was fun, but it wasn't taking me anywhere by right. any means. I was a junior in high school, and so I asked the manager, I was like, you know, the aerobics room sits empty all day long. Could I teach a couple dance classes to all these kids that are up in the daycare? And she was like, sure, go right ahead, I don't care. And so I put a sign-up sheet out on the front desk, and we had 80 kids signed up within wow. a week. So then, and I was charging like, I think 20 to $25 a month, to where then she was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like per this student. Was, yeah. Wow. She was like, this was more than I thought you were gonna do. Because you can't have 80 kids in one class. So I was like, I need like 10 hours. You know, I need to put like eight to 10 kids in a class. Because they were young. And she's like, I gotta talk to the owner about this and we gotta figure out a lease and kinda. So that started my first dance studio um, and I did great. I was a junior in high school and I was making good money and doing what I wanted to do. And so that's how that started. And then when they closed down, I went to work one morning at 6 a.m. and there was a lock on the door. Apparently the owner had gone bankrupt up in Boise and they shut down the gym and I was like, I have a recital in a week. No, wait a second, and wait a second. Students. Are you telling me that you had up to 80 kids signed up and then one day your whole business just got shut down because the, there was a lock on the door? Well, Sports World got shut down, but my business was separate. It was Messina's Elite Technique. Terrible name, terrible name. 
Um, and we just rented space inside Sports World. I quit the front desk. I wasn't working in the gym anymore because I was just teaching these classes all afternoon. And I was working at the movie theater and then at the mall as well. And so I called my mom. I worked the 6 a.m. shift, so I went to work at like 5 a.m. to be ready for the 6 a.m. aerobics classes. And so I showed up at 5, 5.30. It was a snowy day, and, um, and the locks were... The building was all locked up, and I called my mom. I was like, Mom, I don't know what to do. Like, we have a show in a week, and now I have nowhere to rehearse or hold my classes. So she jumped right in the car, and we went downtown on Main Street and got my first building. Um, it's now Ty's Tattoos, but it was right, it's right next to Great Harvest across from Austin Inc. Mm-hmm. We bought that, and um, my grandpa and my dad laid a floor in pretty much overnight, and we put up mirrors overnight, and I was only shut down for about a day. And we resumed classes, and I stayed in that location until I got married and had two kids. And then I sold that business for about $5,500 when we moved. I had mm, probably the same 80. I've never gone huge with the dance thing. I I like to keep it more manageable. Um, So I probably had about 80 students. So we sold it for $5,500 when I was 21, and we moved, and that got us through our living expenses for the first year of medical school when we moved. So Wow. Okay. So just to clarify, your husband is a doctor now. Yes. Oh yeah. And you were married when uh how old did you say you were? I got married at twenty a week after my twentieth birthday. So, okay. So I started that at seventeen. What a birthday present. I know, right? <laughs> so I started the studio at seventeen. We got married at twenty. Um when I got pregnant with my first daughter um, we bought a snow shack, the Tropical Snow franchise. So we had our. Was well, the one that's still around today? Well, they're they're still around, but we sold our. After a couple of years, we sold ours, but ours was the one that was at Delita that would stand at Delita. Okay. So we I had that. that, and all my dance students, my teenage dance students, and my sisters worked it, and I worked it pregnant, and because I, it kind of leads into the dripstick story and why we invented the dripstick, like. Frozen ice, popsicles, what, that is my main pregnancy craving. And so we were running, my husband was buying like 10 snow cones a day when I was pregnant with her. And then after a while, he's like, let's just see how much it would be to just buy our own to buy the franchise. And then you can have all the free snow cones you want all day long. <laughs> so we bought that and worked that. He had a roofing company with his brother and he roofed houses through ISU and painted houses. And I, Worked in the snow shack, danced on ISU's dance team, and worked at my dance studio. And then we moved. We sold the studio, the roofing company, and the snow cone franchise, and that went to med school. So, wow. Okay. Yeah. So that was in our, like, 20, 21s, 22s. Wow. That's, that's a lot for being mm-hmm. young. That's very young. It was fun. It was fun. Wow. So you said that was leading into the dripstick story. Do you have one we can look at? Oh yeah, they're all over the place. So this is the most current. So this is, so this was in residency at med school, and we lived in South Bend, Indiana, which is a huge industrial hub. They make a lot of motorhomes, a lot of um, Pinewood Derby parts for the cars. Lots of plastic manufacturing happens there because we could have never done this living here. It only really happened because we were there. Um, but so this, this end holds anything in a stick, popsicles, fudge sickles, whatnot. Um, and then if you flip it over, any, so anything in a cone, like any sort of ice cream cone. cone. Yep. And then after some patent infringement issues and whatnot, we, um, added this accessory, which now you can fill up that reservoir with pudding, yogurt, juice, whatever, Mm -hmm. freeze it. Um, it's frozen flip it around and then kids can eat it and it catches the drips they can set it down go do your homework come back my kids still use them when they're doing their homework wow in high school because they can just make an ice cream cone set it down i'd come down at one point we had like 24 employees working in this office in the warehouse above us wow and i'd come down on all the we kind of had unlimited ice cream and popsicles it was like a work benefit Uh and employees would always have these with ice cream cones we had like four computers all over the place and so even adults I mean we use them all the time so wow but it's been 10 years since we did that what in the world so I mean so you had a problem which most Mm -hmm. entrepreneurs find they have a problem they need to solve and in this case your hands get sticky you can't just leave your ice cream cone there yeah what 
what would you say was your inspiration for a product like this? Well, so we kind of always had ideas. Like, we had a little notebook of all these ideas. And I actually went to, it was a different idea I had. And I was like, there's all these manufacturers. I'm going to check this out. Um, so I went and met with them and told them this idea. And they were like, mm, I don't know about that. But, and I had kind of lightly mentioned this. And they were like, but that idea is pretty cool. And so we started talking a little more about that idea. But it was... I didn't realize at the time how lucky I had gotten in that I went to this meeting, I was eight months pregnant, um, and I walked in and there were like 12 executives in business suits at this big oval table, and I was like, I thought this was just a casual little meeting with a guy in a jumpsuit in a, in a manufacturing plant, like I didn't realize. And, um, and they took me very seriously, and they were so, my experience is very different, I think, from anybody else that I've talked to in this industry, and in that, they were so good to me. It was B&B Molders in Indiana. I'm still with them. I've tried others. I've gone to China. I've done a lot of different things and I've returned kind of to home because they just, it was not, and I didn't realize it was not the norm for me to be in the factory every day and watching the machines and I sat with the engineers and watched them do my drawings and asked questions and and they were so patient and they explained everything. And I thought that's what I was supposed to do. I thought I'm supposed really? to know inside out what my patent is writ what's written in there, how this works, how the press makes these, how, what every single line on this CAD drawing means. I didn't realize that's not how, that's not normal. And they were so good at, you know, yeah, come on, come sit down, we'll show you all these things. And, and I learned so, so much about manufacturing with them and I'd come in after I had the baby I'd come in with five kids in tow and they'd let the kids run through the factory and pour silicone and polypropylene in the press and I mean it was and it, since then you know they have told me like we just love like you were a different story you were totally different than Boy Scout parts and making right. RV parts like when you walked in and you have all these little kids with you and like a field trip with the Price family, you know, and we spent hours and hours of our days, you know, picking out colors for drip sticks and letting the kids order colorant and catalogs and watch all the plastic pour and they were so, so good really? to us. Yeah. That yeah. was really cool. It was really cool. And that would be different. So yeah. what role, I guess, you kind of mentioned this a little bit, what role did your family play in the manufacturing of all this? Um, well, at the very beginning, um, our extended family was needed a lot because we lived in Indiana. We had five kids in seven years, and it required a lot of travel for me, a lot of trade shows, a lot of trips to Chicago to the attorneys, and which Chicago was 45 minutes away by train. It wasn't an extensive, but my kids were really, really young. I had just had a baby. So um, we, were, we found after a while that you can't do much without going to trade shows at that time. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was traveling and so we were flying in, my mother-in-law and my mother and sisters to watch kids while I was doing trade shows. And, and it was really hard. Um, uh, I gotta keep the emotions in check. <laughs> It was really hard, and Jared was in residency, and it was it was a big risk. It was, but it was really exciting. Like my father-in-law, um, several of my husband's brothers are engineers, so they had helped with CAD drawings. A couple had invested. My in-laws were our main investors, um, and my father-in-law was a great businessman, so he was really good at just kind of mentoring me along the way and making me do the work that I was trying to shortcut. Um, like when I wanted, when I, when we asked for the investment in the loan, he made me fill out more paperwork than I think a bank would because he wanted me to learn that if you want the money, you're going to have to, you're going to have to work for it. So, um, it was, it was a family venture. It was really fun. It required a lot. My kids have never, ever known life without the dripstick, really. Rockney never. Um, we have pictures of him in his car seat out in the warehouse and me packaging. We have pictures of all four of the kids standing in a line with the baby at the end and they're all wrapping hang tags around drip sticks and stapling them up for big orders. So they've always learned to work. And I used to have so much guilt about working so much because people still say all the time, like, you don't have to do this. And, and I don't, but I, 
I do love it. And as my kids have gotten older and become teenagers, and and they've been raised differently than I or my husband were. Like we've they've had a life of privilege that we didn't have, and it's hard to find that balance of giving them enough but not too much, and still wanting them to work and have to earn it. And as they've gotten older and I've seen their work ethic and I've seen the risks they will take and the things they've learned from our businesses, um, I don't feel so bad anymore because our kids, they know how to work. They're creative, they're risk takers, they've watched and observed and every business that I've had, the studio or and the, we have our three girls work at the spa and price products, our kids have always been very involved in those businesses and they've learned a lot and um, and they know they know how to work. Our holidays are not holidays. They're usually working, and some think I should feel bad about that. But um, good lessons. We're a very tight knit family. The kids get along great because they know how to work together, and they know when the orders come in, the family's got to work to get them done. And it's it's their legacy. That's why we keep it up, and um, and it's important to the family. So. They wow. handle it well. Wow. It's not normal, but they handle it well. <laughs> no, I don't want to say that's totally normal, but that's really cool. And I was going to add, that kind of answered my question I wanted to ask you is how do you, how do you balance managing all these different businesses and being a mom at the same time? Because most moms, I mean, a lot of moms are moms full time. Yeah. It's, it's all they do. But yeah, you manage with this, with your husband to manage all these different businesses. Yeah. It's good people finding good employees and the right kind of employees I, one of my main blessings is I think I have really good intuition when it comes to people. When I'm interviewing something, I, somebody, I can usually tell within five minutes if they're going to fit in and if not. And sometimes it's, they're interviewing for one business and I'm like, mm, she's not going to fit in here, but she'd be great here instead. And, um, and a lot of times I'll hire and other employees will be like, what were you thinking with her? And I'm like, just give it a month, just wait. And it always works out like I or you know it doesn't and I'm pretty honest about saying I don't know that this is gonna work out but I'll give you 30 days and let's see and usually I'm pretty good at, at intuition and people that way um, and my sister my third sister is my executive our kind of our manager of all of two of our businesses and my executive assistant, director of operations, she's got a couple of titles. And it took me a few years, you know, we had to move back and she, before she became involved, but having her has been life changing. Because working with siblings can be tricky, but when you grow up together, and I have other siblings that I would never work with, but that I love dearly and do other things with, but um, she and I are very similar personality wise when it comes to work. Um, my oldest daughter also is very similar to me in that way. So having the balance of the right people in the right places and as well as a balance of time. So at one point I had, I worked at the spa Monday, Wednesday, Thursday mornings from eight until three until my kids got home. And then I worked at Price Products Tuesday and Friday, eight to three. So I divided my mornings between those two businesses and if I wasn't there, other people were working. It wasn't nobody was running price products. It's just that's when I was in the office to sign papers, take meetings, or whatever. And then I hit the studio um, at 3.30, four days a week, until about 5.36. And my girls are, would be there anyway. They're, they tr have trained since they were two, just like I did. Not even two, birth pretty much. I always taught and had studios wherever we were living. And so I look at it as if I didn't have the studio, they would be training with someone else and I'd be missing that time with them. But because we have the studio, I'm with them. And I hear my friends complain about once their teenagers hit high school, like I never see them anymore. But uh -huh. between track and basketball and a job, they leave at 6 a.m. and they get home at 10. And I know, you know, they leave for Traverse at 6 a.m., they go to school, but they're gonna meet me at the studio from 3.30 and we're gonna be together until 6. And then we'll come home and do dinner and boyfriends and homework and whatever. But that is, even though it's work time, it's also family time because mm -hmm. my girls are all there. So we get a lot of time together. So, and I know people look at me and think, she's working so much, how in the world does she do some mother? Because I've heard that. 
I'm actually with my kids a lot because my three girls work at the spa. Mm -hmm. Presley and Regan are both apprenticing in permanent cosmetics, so they're with me all the time at the spa. And then we're at the studio together every afternoon, so we're actually, I'm probably with my kids more than most parents with teenagers anyway. Yeah. So it works, but it's a very... It's a very delicate balance of schedules, for sure. Right. That is incredible how you're able to balance by your work and your family by bringing your family into, into work. work. Yeah. Well, I don't know if it's better saying that or it's, or if you're better off saying bring your work into family. Because there's know. a lot of kids that don't know how to work. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know. I hire some of them. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. No, it, cool. it works out good. And Jared will take the boys and they'll go to the apartments and fix things at the apartments and they were digging cars out of the snow all the last three days at all of the units so it does it provides good work and good family time so wow. yeah that is really cool all right so for anyone watching if you do have any of your own questions feel free to ask it is live and we're able to see all of sorry let me find the video any comments you guys post, we're able to see here on my computer. And any questions you have for Messina, we'll be able to ask her uh, straight away. So, oh, in fact, we would just like to do a shout out to Christy, Wendy, and Carly. Hey, thanks for watching, guys. Thank you. So, let's keep on going with the story about price products. So, okay. you started manufacturing uh, the strip stick. Yeah. What? was next so that's just the manufacturing part what about right. the marketing and the selling you know and I I like I'm glad that you asked that question because I think the question I get the most is how do you do this or everybody wants to talk about the American dream and how to do it and I am NOT the person that's gonna say go do it and make your dreams come true because it has been extremely hard it's been an American nightmare more than the dream and the only way I was able to do it was because I was not our primary income. And I, it is so hard for me to watch people risk it all when it's not, it doesn't always pay off. And it's hard, manufacturing is very hard, sales is hard, and America, I feel like our country has a lot of holes when it comes to patent issues, manufacturing and distribution, and if I lived in Washington, D.C., that's probably where I'd spend my time, is working on those things. Because I've seen firsthand the flaws in the system and how it affects a family's income or somebody's plans. Um, for example, our patent, when we first started, I was quoted 4200 for our patent, and it ended up at $85,000 is wow. what we paid to get our patent. Um, and even then, we've still had 12 knockoffs in various countries and the patent is not a worldwide patent. And by the time you realize, oh, I need a worldwide patent, uh -huh. you only have 18 months from your initial filing. So by the time you're successful enough that these knockoffs are happening and you realize, I really need a worldwide patent, you've missed that 18 month deadline and oh. you can't file. So all these knockoffs all over the world, I mean, I, I would guess there's people making more money on this than I am because there's nothing I can do about a lot of them. Some of them aren't even worth, like we've had Walmart and Target and some of the others um, that are within the US and those came down to, we fought a couple, did find there, and those kind of corporations and monopolies definitely have their way of getting around those, even if you win the case and even if you win your judgment, those companies are very successful for a reason, and they know how to get around those judgments and those payments, mm -hmm. and and it's just kind of win, fighting a losing battle. And some people will fight and fight and fight, and that's great if that's where they are. For me, I'm a very energy conscious person um, and very time aware, and I learned within the first couple of years, I cannot just sit in a courtroom while my kids are at home with someone else and count my minutes fighting for money I don't necessarily need like it's just not worth it and mm -hmm. having that negative energy in my business that's kind of when we started doing because it was just price products for a long time and then we moved back and started doing other things within our community that we saw that we wanted to accomplish and that was when I started venturing into other things was price products was starting to get too overwhelming with the court the patent infringement cases and the knockoffs and it just wasn't as fun as it had been in the beginning. And if it's not fun, 
I mean, it wasn't our primary income, so it's not like I had the pressure of you have to keep going. It was like, you know what, I'm just let them have the knockoff. It's fine. We'll stick with the retailers we have. I'm not going to put the money and fly all over the country and sit in court to fight for something that, what's the end result going to be? Some money is just not worth leaving my family and having that negative energy because it, it weighs on you. I've never been through a divorce, but I would imagine it's the same thing. Like, it's your baby. You know, you have right. your patent, and it's like, I created this out of nothing, and then other people are selling it and making money and making a living off of it, and it, it just it rips your heart apart. So you yeah. just have to know when to walk away, <laughs> take a breath, and focus on something else and really prioritize how important is it you know, it's a piece of plastic. Really? So. Interesting. So it's not always about the money. It's about oh. the time and you said energy, which is really interesting. Yeah. yeah. Because that would take a lot of energy to be able to fight something like that. Yeah. Um, now, just so I understand right, this is a kind of like a side thing. You said that, from what I understood, it sounded like you were saying that Walmart, people like Walmart and Target would come up with their own knockoffs. Yeah. So if I see one of these in Walmart, it probably isn't it's yours. Not. No. Really? Do you often find products, oh, yeah. your products in Walmart? All the t well, the c Walmart carries them year round. They carry them. They're, they're there. Wow. They're there. That's got to be frustrating. I'm really sorry to bring that That's up. That's why I never go to Walmart. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Where's your favorite place to shop? Uh, what's my favorite place to shop? Yeah, where do you, where do you go shopping? Fred Meyer. Fred Meyer. Yeah, I mean for groceries. Fred yeah. Meyer. But my dad was a manager for Fred Meyer for years and years. He just retired this year, so... You know, another yeah. family, another, another family support, yeah. loyal thing there. So, wow. yeah, I, I avoid Walmart at all costs for several reasons, not just that. But interesting, yeah, yeah. interesting. So, I wanted to ask you about oh, what was it? The question just slipped my mind. Um, okay, yeah, I was gonna ask you. So, currently, where do you stand with price products? So, okay, so. I'm not super traditional in the way we have run this business in that for several years it was very big. We had, it was right when we moved back here, we hired a ton of people. Um, we had an accountant sitting here full time and all of our sales. I was traveling and doing 10 to 12 trade shows a year and it was really, on paper, it looked really great. Mm -hmm. It was really hard in that we bought this home for a reason because of the layout and because I knew I didn't want to have a warehouse downtown where I had to drive 20 minutes to get to work every morning and whatnot. And so, so this, you know, we had our office and then the warehouse was where we did all of our packaging and shipped out of there. And, and after it got so big, our home didn't feel like our home anymore. Like we had employees walking in and out of the kitchen to mm -hmm. get, like I remember one day I was making bread and I had four loaves of bread and I went in my room for a little while and came out and two were gone. And a bunch of the employees, they were, we hired, I had tended to hire a lot of ISU athletes because they could lift a lot. They were tall in the warehouse. They just worked and I could work with their schedules and because we ran a 24 hour rotation. So we had some that would come work through like 12 to 6 a.m. You know, through the night. So it worked with school. And they had just come in the kitchen and, oh, she baked bread. It must be for us and help themselves. and. <laughs> And the kids couldn't come down here and watch TV or do anything without a couple of the employees walking in to see what they were doing and chat and then sitting down mm -hmm. and hanging out. And so our home was just kind of getting overridden with the job. And in a way, it was really fun. And I loved a lot of the employees that from that time and still do. But after a while, it was like, why are we doing this? Like, it's, financially, we don't, like, is this really healthy for the family and the kids? Right. And so, um, I don't remember the initial question, Mitch. What the, was so, <laughs> the, qu the question, and you're doing a great job of answering it. Um, what was, what is the current state okay. of price products? So, at that point, when it was getting really crazy, and my father-in-law at the very beginning said, your biggest problem is going to be growing too fast. I, spe I specifically remember what he was wearing and where we were sitting when he said that. Because I was like, are you crazy? Like, that's not a problem. Like, let's do it. And that's exactly what happened, was it grew too fast. And and what that means is you have to have the capital to keep up with the growth. And so though they've given us the initial investment to manufacture our first run and to go to our first trade show, um, that, was, that money was spent extremely quickly. And then we were left with all these orders. And the way it works is it's a circle of 
where we're a seasonal product, technically, I mean, this is considered kind of a summertime mm -hmm. toy store retail item. So we would get all of our orders for the year and know, okay, for next summer, which is shipping usually February, March, like Hobby Lobby would ship first of January for their spring line, which was our whole Christmas. We'd spend our entire Christmas break putting together a Hobby Lobby order every year. So we would know, okay, for next year we need a million dollars worth of product based off of last year's sales and give a little bit of growth. Well, we have to manufacture that, you know, six months ahead of time. So we have to come up with that money six months ahead of time. So you've got to have half a million dollars, quarter of a million dollars just sitting there. When we lived in Indiana and places like that, that was no problem because back there they tend to be a little more creative business wise. When we moved to Pocatello mm -hmm. and went to the bank and said, we need half a million dollars. We just got out of residency and he hasn't even started his job yet. <laughs> It was like, are you insane? And I was going, are you insane? Like we've had this business three years, here's all of our reports, this is how much business we do. And in Pocatello, they just didn't understand what we did and right. what we required and how much money was involved and that it was a sure thing, you know, like we are, we, these are POs, we are gonna get the money, but it's gonna be in eight months. Mm -hmm. So that, it's a cycle of having to keep up with the growth that unless you're extremely financially stable and very risky is very difficult and you really have to know in entrepreneurship you have to know your personality because there are so many people that get into it because they don't want to work for someone else or they want to control their own income or their own destiny and within 10 minutes of talking to them I'm going you don't have the personality like you're not motivated enough or you don't have enough drive or there's no commitment or there's no organized organization up here. How are you gonna organize your schedule or employees or all of the financial things that are involved? And so it's really about being honest with yourself and who you are. And if you're not the right person, it's okay. Just surround yourself with people that are. I know my weaknesses and I know my shortcomings and those are the people I hire in my mm -hmm. key positions, those that are better at those things than I am. Wow. So, and then it works when you have a well-balanced you know, working situation with the people around you, that's when you're able to accomplish a lot. But you can't do it by yourself. And you can't hire your friends and your family just because they're your friends and family. You really have to find the people that have strengths where you're weak. Wow. So. Well, that was a lot of really good information. Thanks. Man, Messina, I really appreciate this interview. <laughs> it's it's 118. It's, it's time to wrap this All show right. up. But Messina, that's a great story. It's an incredible story. Thanks. And